Thanks, Tim. Okay. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure and honor to be here talking to you. Um, what about me? I, uh, <clears throat> uh, I did my master's at Cornell uh, very recently, graduated in, at the end of 2018, and very shortly thereafter started coming here uh, around January, I guess. And uh, it's been a lot of fun, so thank you very much, Jim and Tim. Uh, for keeping this uh, going. It's, it's uh, really great. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about project organization from headache to new make. Uh, this is kind of a, a boring title, and this is the last title of the year, so happy holidays. Uh, I'm going to make things for you. right, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, project organization. There's a lot of stuff on this. You can find all sorts of stuff. Our very own Jim and uh, Jenny Bryan uh, put together this document with a lot of a lot of great information on on various uh, uh, procedural things, workflow related things on uh, you know best practices in using uh, R. Um, a lot of things that I see come up is like uh, you know always start R with a blank slate. This is a <laughs> great idea. Um, there's a ton of information in this document. This is uh, our stats, what they forgot to teach you about R. Um, so definitely a lot more qualified people than I have been thinking about this. I've been listening to Not So Standard Deviations. Re uh, just found it recently for some reason. Um, I love it. Uh, and project design comes up a lot. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, this is nothing new. Uh, nevertheless, um, you know, it's, it's kind of new to me. Uh, in, in the sense that in grad school nobody really talked about this, you know, this is, I, I kind of had to figure this stuff out on my own. So if you're like me uh, and nobody really talked to you about this stuff, um, hopefully this could, you know, uh, speed you along or, or give you a sense of uh, what to do and what not to do. So why organize your room? Um, maybe it's to find things easier. Although the person in that image probably says, I can find everything. <laughs> I know where everything is. Um, maybe it's to reduce anxiety. You know, uh, A nice, clean space to be in is definitely a lot more pleasant than a cluttered one. Or maybe it's just, uh, if you're like me, <laughs> you only clean up because somebody's coming over or something like that. Um, and I, I think this, you know, this is kind of like, projects, right? Uh, it's definitely a not, lot nicer when you're in a well-organized project. Um, but, you know, like myself, I didn't really start thinking about project organization until somebody was going to look at my code, right? Um, or I needed somebody to reproduce my code. And so, um, yeah, if we just take this to its logical conclusion, I guess hotels are kind of the the you know the apex of reproducibility in, in living situations, right? Everybody needs to know where things are. They need to know how to use the TV in the hotel, right? So they optimize for that sort of thing. Anyway, uh, again, I wasn't taught this stuff, so you end up with stuff that looks like this, right? This is a project of mine. My thesis, but look at this. This is kind of like ridiculous, right? Um, it's, it's incomprehensible, right? Like, if you just took a look at this and you just ask, where do I start? Um, who knows? Who, what was that? Oh. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and, you know, looking back at this, I'm kind of baffled. Like, why do I have an old folder? Because at this point, I was using Git. So, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, this one's even, <laughs> even older. Um, at this point, I was not using Git. Um, so you, do, you have these things, like, you know, uh, round one. Round 2.1, again, here's an old file. Uh, you know, you can't really test stuff without copying your folders and just copying the entire state of the project, and things get really messy really quickly. Uh, OK, so what was especially wrong with all that? Um, I never explicitly like told myself this. Like, I'm the only one who's really going to use this so I can be lazy. Um, but that's kind of how things work, right? Um, it's kind of subconscious. Uh, you know what you ran. You know where that data file was that you might have saved. Um, and uh, 
not every, you know, other people coming into the project don't necessarily know. Um, so I think, uh, you know, reproducibility and project organization, they go hand in hand in that if you have a reproducible project, it's probably a good design. Um, and the inverse is true as well. Uh, so that grad, grad school code, before I, especially before I started using Git, uh, uh, not especially well documented. Um, a lot of ambiguity, ambiguity in file naming and uh, particularly what the authoritative version is of the code. Um, and projects weren't self-contained. They would call out to another folder on my hard drive and well, you, you all know the pitfalls with that. Um, and curiously, even up until recently, I never really recorded anything about my R install or the package versions. Um, I, I'd say uh, by 2018, I was using Microsoft's R, which has Checkpoint. Um, so at least there's that. But um, you know, with this project, I didn't write it down. I know it was run on 341, but nobody else knows that. Um, so not great. Um, so over time, I started picking up a couple tools. Uh, Git, our projects, of course, uh, New Make, and most recently, our Env. Um, and I think that uh, just by using these tools, they sort of, I don't know, induce their philosophies on you, um, especially Git. Um, and if, if I had to condense uh, what these induced philosophies are uh, by using these tools, um, it's that it makes you work or just do actions that force you to be intentional, deliberate. Um, they force you to codify things, just write stuff down, and they force you to be very explicit in what you are writing down. And so, um, yeah, I'm just going to talk about uh, each of the tools and how they kind of embody these three principles. Um, but I also want to kind of show what the project evolution looks like over time. Um, you know, I got into grad school uh, around, uh, what was it, yeah, end of 2015, fall 2015, um, and so that's my very first project, and then the second project, third project, and it wasn't until like more than halfway through my program that I started using Git. Um, and I think that came from the fact that, you know, I had gotten one or two projects under my belt and had figured out, you know, this is kind of not, <laughs> not very manageable, um, so I wanted to use Git. And uh, the, uh, the value add, I guess, is, is immediate, immediately apparent at, as soon as I started using Git. Um, I had a project, uh, it was a simulation study that my lab was going to do together, and we wanted to have a bunch of volunteer computers uh, jump, jump in and jump out as they, you know, as your laptops, as you wanted to work on your laptop, just have them participate on a volunteer basis to solve these simulation problems. Um, and so since everybody, it's not like, you know, I'm SSHing into everybody's laptop to get it done, I had to rely on people to be able to re reproduce the project on their own. Um, so Checkpoint helped uh, the package management uh, package. Uh, it helped with that, but, you know, I don't think it would have been really possible to synchronize all the changes that we made in time uh, without Git. And so, um, yeah, uh, I think Git is extremely important. Um, the other thing I want to point out is the, the lifespan of these projects kind of went from like, you know, whales down to on the right of the graph when I started at Progressive, they're kind of like fruit flies now, right? Um, so with the extremely short lifespan of the project, you know, I need to get started quicker. Um, I need to uh, stay organized, of course, but um, it allowed me to iterate. Uh, a little, a little more. You know, um, I can change change uh, one thing here and there, see how it works, um, and uh, just you know, writing it down in a in a shell script just to get me started every time uh, really helped the project or my organization, my mental model of organization evolve quicker. Okay, so Git. Uh, John gave a talk on uh, open source collaboration uh, a couple of months ago on Git. 
Um, and I, I'm not, I'm gonna try to stay away from it, like getting into the tool too much, um, but I do wanna talk about you know, how it kind of embodies this, this, these ideas of good project design. Uh, so Git, uh, in my opinion, is essential to any workflow, collaborative or otherwise. And you, may, you can make the argument for any uh, version control software, but I think that's, that's imperative to have. Um, why? Because it reduces or eliminates uncertainty and code changes over time. Um, but more personally, it just gives you this feeling of safety that you can build upon your code without worrying about, you know, uh, am I going to lose something? Am I going to break something? Um, do I have to make a copy of my entire directory to ensure that I don't break anything? Uh, Git resolves all of those things. Um, and uh, it, it sort of uh, embodies this idea of intentionality in that entering objects into the repository is a very deliberate process, right? Um, I suppose you could say git add dot, just add everything if you wanted to. Um, but if you're actually going through and adding things one at a time, it does, you do have to confront, you know, what files are worth including in the repository. If I don't include them, do other people or myself in the future depend on those files? And if, if I don't include them, do I have a way to get those files to the people or myself in the future who needs them? Um, so you have to think about that uh, if your project is going to be reproducible. But I think more naturally, it kind of just eliminates the dependence on these old folders or manual versioning of folders. Um, and uh, I don't know if anyone's ever actually, you know, it's a noble idea to save old code in a folder, but I don't know if anyone's actually re uh, restored a project uh, from breaking by digging through those old folders. Um, so uh, this, this really does help. Um, commit messages are required. Uh, so it forces you to write something down. Um, I guess you could pass an argument saying I don't want to write anything, but um, at least once the committer is forced to you know, confront the implications of the change of the code. They have to write something. Um, and again, you could just you know, get commit all and just not, not write anything sensible, but we all know that's it's bad practice. So I think most of us are at least thinking a little bit about what's going, uh, what's passing through into the repository. Um, and GitHub, in particular, because they sort of format the README files so nicely, it, it, it was a, a natural encouragement to you know just have these everywhere, sort of, um, and and just by making that like all oh, this. Just having readmes everywhere, oh, I can do that. Um, there's not a problem with that. Uh, you know, some comments are better than none. Uh, so the, I really started using, you know, just markdown documents to write stuff down uh, whenever I can. And of course, Git, you can write as much as you want, uh, but the code history is its own explicit record of what happened. It's, it's you know, extremely precise. Uh, you can go back and find, um, exactly what you did on a specific day uh, and who did it. So that's Git. Um, very briefly, I'm going to just go over how projects and packages kind of fit into this idea. Um, so uh, both of these uh, projects in particular, they require the user to define a, an entry point for their project, right? Everything is sort of, the idea is everything's relative to the, the, the root of the package, uh, of the project folder. Um, and that's sort of uh, what the, uh, the here package uh, aims to resolve is, you know, it kind of anchors to either the R project file or whatever, wherever you have the dot here file. Um, so uh, it's intention, it, it sort of uh, molds the user to, or conditions them to, you know, keep things in this directory. Don't spread everything to over multiple directories. Um, keep things relative to here. <coughs> um, and in our proj file clearly demarcates in our, our proj file, uh, in our project, and contains some settings about the project, of course. Um, but packages, what, what they encourage, which is really important, is in terms of codification, is they heavily encourage documentation of code, especially with the Roxygen package. Um, it's just become commonplace. Everybody kind of does it, I think. Um, so that's great. 
Um, and uh, oh, it looks like I didn't update my slides for this. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's some, uh, our projects kind of discourage this cross folder structure. Um, The third tool that I want to just go over briefly is our ENF. I found this, well, I mean, I guess it, it just went on CRAN recently. Um, and I think, uh, so this succeeds PackRat. It's a package management system. Um, and I think it's, I've tried Checkpoint, I've tried PackRat, and um, I think this is sort of a formula perfected. I don't want to like, you know, uh, be yeah, overly optimistic about it. But as far as I've tried it, it's worked splendidly. Um, I have not had any issues with this. Uh, package. Um, and so I want to talk about the API of this very briefly. Um, oh, well, that's not working too well. Uh, no, not great. That's okay. Okay. Um, so that, this is kind of the basic workflow of our env. You start a project, you do our env in it, um, and that sets up some folders for you. Um, changes the R profile a little bit um, and uh, changes the library path to a directory within that project. Um, and then you take snapshots as you iterate with your code and it, it enters in, you know, what R version are you using, where did you get your packages, and what package versions are you using. It just, you know, it writes these to a JSON file. And then if you, if you go to another workstation or you operate on a cluster or um, your friend wants to reproduce the analysis, uh, our env restore will go out and get all the packages for you. Um, so uh, intentionality, our env consent is literally a function uh, in this package. You have to, you know, it's, it's very deliberate. I want to start tracking all of my packages. And it forces the user con to confront, you know, what's, what packages are in this project? What packages do I need for this project? I don't want to just like call library to everything I own, you know, uh, even if I don't use it. Um, <coughs> and uh, I really like the way it, it uh, uh, sort of records the package versions. I suppose in the past you could have used session info uh, to try and uh, you know recover like you know I used all these packages in my analysis. And maybe you could restore a project from this, um, but it's it's much cleaner and much nicer uh, to look at it this way, and and it's you know machine readable, and you can uh, just restore directly uh, using this JSON file. And so we have the R R version, um, we have the repository where I, I used a Microsoft snapshot on uh, December second. And these are all the, the file version, uh, package versions that I used in this project, literally, to build this presentation. Um, so it, it's extremely powerful for reproducibility, which again goes hand in hand with uh, good project organization. And uh, package versions and sources are explicit, and you can even specify non-standard repositories like GitHub and and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I want to talk about, uh, we're, we're at NewMake. This is in the title. I, I guess this is sort of the star of the show today. Um, and this is, uh, like I showed in, the, in a slide way back when, I just picked this tool up recently within the past few months. Um, and I think it's really changed the way I, I work, um, definitely. And uh, so it's an old, it's been around for forever, since 1973. Um, and what it does is it orchestrates the creation of targets that you define by evaluating dependencies that you also define. Um, and it looks at the modification time difference between those. Um, and if the target is older than the dependencies, uh, then it'll rebuild it. Uh, it'll rebuild the target. Um, there's a new package called Drake that's strictly our focus that also works really well. I'm not going to cover that today. Um, but what it does on top of uh, new make, among many other things, is that it, it actually uses checksums of, of the target uh, uh, output files or even objects in your R uh, in your analysis workflow. Um, it saves all that. Really nice. Um, so this is the syntax 
of new make keeps doing that but uh, you specify a target to the left of this colon that's a file um, and then you specify a number of dependencies that the target depends on and then you ha have to use a tab uh, but any shell command can be specified here that builds a valid target um, and th that's most of the syntax it's it's pretty readable um, I think um, and so this is the make file that is used to make this project this presentation um, there's a lot of stuff that we'll go over in the demo but what this says is everything is a function of data transformations analyses reports and finally the presentation um, and so we can see that data is dependent on this Excel spreadsheet. Okay, well, where does that Excel spreadsheet come from? This Excel spreadsheet comes from, uh, it depends on this script here, import voting rate data. It depends on my functions in the R directory. And then to execute this, to, to receive this Excel spreadsheet, I just call R script on that vo import voting rate data script. Um, and so calling that uh, make data will uh, run the script and I can get the Excel spreadsheet uh, in there uh, but it's not really you know just for that um, when, when I say make all it runs through the entire pipeline um, and what is special about this is if you ever have to or if you ever modify the source code of uh, a script early in the um, early in the pipeline, uh, it'll know where to start. So if I modify a script in the middle of the pipeline, it's not going to rebuild everything from the start, because that's the same. Um, it's just going to start from the middle and keep going from there. Um, so again, new make, it, it, uh, it's a very intentional, very deliberate system. Uh, the workflow is deliberately constructed. Um, and uh, it forces the user to confront the reproducibility of the project right then and there. If you can't make all from scratch, if you can't run the pipeline in its entirety, something's broken and you'll be notified of that right away so you can fix it. Uh, it's written down somewhere. There's a make file that defines all of this stuff. Um, and I think it's more actionable certainly than, than the sort of lexical ordering of files, 01 load, 02 clean. O3 analyze um, that does give information about what's to be run when, um, but this is automated. You know, it's much easier to type just make all, um, and the workflow is very precise. Um, you define inputs and outputs, and the chain of e events is elaborated in great detail. Um, and new make is is the tool that kind of, I guess, exposed me to this idea of Unix software design, to a philosophy which is two of which are to write programs that do one thing and do it well. Uh, most of the make recipes kind of depend on a single output. You can have multiple outputs, but then it gets a little hairy. Um, and write programs to work together. So each of your scripts kind of just flows in a pipeline. Um, and uh, they, in theory, if you do it right, they should all work nicely together. OK, so uh, we're at 23 minutes. Briefly, uh, I want to recompile this presentation um, with a couple of other things. Um, I have up on GitHub sorry. Okay. So I have on GitHub this directory. Um, and you'll notice that in the presentation folder, for example, only the source is present. The HTML document's not there. Um, there's no output folder. In the input folder, there's some information, but, um, you know, no images here. This is source file here. Um, so, you know, nothing up my sleeve. <laughs> um, 
<coughs> Oops. Well, Firefox is being uncooperative. So anyway, I'm just going to clone this in. Uh, I'm cloning that GitHub repository that I just showed you. Um, and uh, I'll verify again, there's no output directory. Um, if I look in the presentation directory, there's no HTML file. Um, if I look in the report directory, there's no, again, no HTML file. Nothing's here. Um, and first, uh, I'm going to just do make data. Right? So it's, uh, oh, look, it failed to find our env. Our env is smart enough that it will uh, download and install itself um, because there is a, uh, there's some uh, source files for our env that's in there. Um, so uh, at this point, I kind of already messed up, but I'm just going to do this again. <laughs> yeah. So um, I forgot my own workflow. Um, I have in here uh, a shell script that uh, makes a couple folders, but then calls first our Ember store. Um, and this is obviously not robust because it checks to see if our env library is there. Um, and since our env installed itself, that's going to be there, and then. This is not going to run. So anyway, <laughs> um, I could make this better, but this is just for the uh, for the sake of example. Um, okay, we're starting afresh, uh, and uh, it's installing our env again. And this time, what it's going to do is it's going to look for the packages in the lock file, the rnv.lock file, um, and it's going to ask me, "Do you want to install these?" And I've already installed them, so our env is smart enough to look in the cache and link them to my project without going, uh, going out and installing them all over and over and over and over again. Um, and so now I'm ready. So I, I now. Is cache a specific thing, or is it looking in your paths? Uh, so the cache is slow. Yeah. So if this is a new machine, now it's going to install everything. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. yeah. You already have that exact version on your computer. Um, so if it's already, no, I think it, it takes, if it's not in the, if it's already in the regular library path, Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Right, right, right. Separate. Yeah, that, but that cache is separate. Yeah. I think, I think if you want to use libraries, you already have the hydrate is the function mm -hmm. that copies it into the cache. Um, and by default, the cache is located in your user app data local rnv, um, and it all goes in there. OK. Um, so now I can make data. And uh, what did that do? Um, if I look at uh, the file, um, what it's doing is there's an there's a Excel spreadsheet somewhere on the internet. Um, and I'm going to go use curl to go get it. Um, but first, I'm going to check that you know, the HTML, uh, H the HTTP code returns OK. Uh, and then it's going to download the file, and I'm going to check that the file exists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's what make data did. Um, and so the next step in the pipeline is transformations, right? Um, but I don't have to do them one by one. Um, I can just say make all. Um, and it's going to start from the transformation script. The data is already made. It's, it's already there. It knows that. And so it's going to go through, and we're already in the, in the analysis. It ran some regressions. Now it's building the report. Um, but uh, I think that's the major difference between this and just the bash script that you know, runs all your things in, in order is that if you did something, let's say that data step took three hours to run for some, some reason. I don't want to do that again uh, if I don't have to. Um, and so, you know, if, if nothing's changed, if the state hasn't changed, or at least the modification times as 
make is concerned with it, then it won't rebuild those, uh, those objects again. OK, so now uh, we see that at the very end, uh, some HTML document was output. Um, and lo and behold, here's the presentation. And if everything went right, it should look exactly as, um, as, I, as I just showed you. Um, and so uh, I've been able to build this on three computers now, so <laughs> I have some confidence that it's, it's reproducible. You know, I think that I would feel comfortable if, if you all whipped out your laptops right now, not you progressive people, because uh, <laughs> it doesn't work on progressive systems. Um, but you know, any of us that aren't behind some you know, weird firewalls and stuff, I would feel confident that if you made all, you know, just ran the init, init script and then made all, you could also have a, uh, the, uh, the documents right in front of you. Um, so I guess I didn't really go into like what it did in the, in the meantime, but you know, it kind of just got the data. Uh, this is just voting rates over time for each state. Um, ran some regressions in an interaction model, and you know, I get a bunch of intercepts for that, and then I, I run a couple random effects models, and I have commentary and plots and all this stuff. Um, but you know, it just kind of did then split it in you know a split second. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think that you know, make kind of has kind of re revolutionized my workflow, um, and uh, I think it's really efficient. So uh, with that. I'll I'll take questions.